So the time has come. Your patient's breathing is not going well, or perhaps it's in preparation of some procedure that needs to be done, but it's now time to intubate your patient. We've got a lot to cover in discussing this, so let's talk about that in this lesson here. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. As always, the notes for this lesson as well as all the previous videos are available exclusively to the YouTube and Patreon members. You can find links to join both of those down in the lesson description below. Also, don't forget to head over to icuadvantage.com or follow that link down in the lesson description to take a quiz on this lesson, test your knowledge while also being entered into a weekly gift card. As well as don't forget that you can help support this channel through the purchase of an ICU Advantage sticker. Uh, again, those are found at the website icuadvantage.com forward slash support link down in the description. In this lesson here, I'm going to try to cover all the information that I can think of that's important when it comes time to intubate your patient. There's a lot of things going on and things to be aware of and thinking about, and I'm going to attempt to cover as much of that as I can. Oftentimes, things will change based on the situation as well as the provider, so I'll try and cover all bases here. That said, there is much that is the same regardless of where or who or why we're intubating. Just remember that I'll try to cover as much info as possible for as many situations as possible, but things may vary in some depending on the particular situation that you find yourself in. So first things first, the time is here, your patient is needing to be intubated. The situation in which your patient is needing to be intubated can truly vary based on many different things. They could be crashing and in respiratory distress and needing quick emergent intubation. They could be coding and needing a tube placed during the code. They could have just extubated themselves and needing a new tube placed. They may have had escalating respiratory support, but just aren't where we need them to be, but not quite crashing just yet. Or they could be completely awake and alert with no respiratory compromise, but we're needing to intubate them prior to a procedure. Regardless of the situation, there's a few things that need to happen right away. Some of these can happen in different orders, but should all happen immediately after the call to intubate. Once the provider makes the call to intubate, you'll want to start off finding out which meds they want to intubate with. So I'll be talking about the meds a little bit later in this lesson, but each provider is going to have their own preferences as well as really situationally dependent. So find out now so you're ready to go when they get there, if they're not already there. Now, depending on the situation though, this is often something that can be delegated to someone else to pull out and get ready. Next, if they're not already present, let your respiratory therapist know immediately of the plan to intubate. If the patient has been crashing, then they're probably already there with you, but many times they may be elsewhere doing something with another patient. They may have been anticipating this intubation, or it really could have come quickly and unexpectedly. That said, they will need to get equipment ready, as well as get there to the patient as well. So letting them know right away is going to be vital for them, and can really reduce stress and potential delay in this. Also, make sure you let your team know. I've seen it before where an intubation was taking place and almost nobody knew that it was happening. Intubation should almost never be a solo task. Your team is going to be instrumental in preparation for this as well as during the intubation itself. So God forbid something goes wrong, it's really important that we have other people around. Let the others know what's going on and delegate tasks to them as it's appropriate. Now, if it's possible, let the patient know what's going to be going on and ensure them that you're going to be there taking care of them through all of this. And especially when this is an emergent thing, it's often a very scary experience for that patient. You're going to want to try to comfort them and really give them the encouragement that they need during this difficult time. Now, if there's family or visitors present, let them know what's going to be happening as well and then have them go wait in the waiting room. Try to give them a rough timeline and let them know that you will check in with them as soon as possible. This is also going to be scary for them as well and it helps if they aren't left in the dark and they feel supported too. And then from here, we want to be getting equipment and preparing for the intubation, which I'm going to cover now. So there are many different things that we need or may need to have depending on the situation. I'm going to cover as much as I can think of here, but just know that some things may not always be needed or perhaps other things are going to be needed that I don't mention here. So first and foremost is going to be our crash cart or our code cart. 
So go ahead and get this bad boy ready and in the room. Hopefully we're not going to need it, but there's certainly a chance that we will, and you're going to want to have it ready to go especially in the crashing patient or emergent intubation, but this also may not be a bad idea for most, is go ahead and get those defibrillator pads on and have the defibrillator hooked up to the patient on and monitoring. And then we may also be utilizing airway equipment from this card as well. Next is gonna be our bag valve mask. Now in reality, you should already have one of these in the room and as well as being on the crash cart, you should also have one, but just make sure that this is there and available and ready to go. So take it out of the bag, expand it, attach the mask, hook it up to oxygen and set that to the max flow. We will need to bag valve mask the patient prior to intubation as well as once the tube is actually placed. So this is gonna be vital to have ready to go. Also make sure that you do have a oropharyngeal or a nasopharyngeal airway in the event that those are gonna be needed to aid in ventilating the patient. Now for monitoring equipment, your patient's probably already gonna be on the monitor, but if for some reason they're not, make sure that we do have our ECG leads on, that we are monitoring their SpO2, and get a blood pressure cuff on and hooked up. Arterial lines are great, but let's also have the blood pressure cuff as a backup. Ensure that you do have a good reading and a waveform on your SpO2, and then have your blood pressure cuff set to cycle at least every five minutes for right now, although we may increase this once we begin and kind of based on the situation. Now, when it comes to our airway equipment, I've really seen it done differently at different facilities. So some places are just going to use the crash cart for all the equipment that we need, while others have uh, an intubation cart or an intubation box, and then others just grab the equipment that's needed at that time. So really just kind of dependent on how it is where you work. You just want to make sure that you have that stuff together that you're going to need for intubation. Now, next is going to be our laryngoscope. So this is gonna be the primary piece of equipment that's gonna be used to assist in the intubation. So essentially, this is gonna be used to lift that tongue out of the way to better visualize the trachea and vocal cords. It's also helpful in opening and positioning the jaw as well. And so for this, you've got a handle and then a blade that's attached to it. And there's really two types of blades. We have the Mac and the Miller. The MAC is going to be the one with the curved blade, and you can remember that because the C is curved, and then the Miller is going to be the straight blade, which you can think of because the L's are straight. These blades are going to come wrapped after they've been sterilized, and the person who's going to be doing the intubation is often going to have a preference for which blade they want to use, but I do find that almost everybody seems to use the MAC. So you want to take it out and then attach it to the handle. Make sure that you do have batteries in that handle, and then when you attach the blade, flip it open into that 90 degree position, and you wanna make sure that the light on the blade comes on. Once you've checked that, you could go ahead and close it back up so we're not wasting battery uh, until it's time to give it to whoever's gonna be doing the intubation. All right, the next piece of equipment I wanna talk about here is gonna be something called the glide scope, or there's actually other variations of this type of equipment, but this is essentially a video laryngoscope. For the glide scope specifically, it has a light with a camera on the laryngoscope itself that's going to be attached via a cord to a small monitor. Now there are other devices that actually have a little display right on the end of the laryngoscope, but essentially they're doing the same thing. What this does is it actually allows the person intubating to better visualize the trachea and those vocal cords. And some people may reserve its use in the cases of difficult intubations, but it does seem that its use in more routine intubations is becoming more common. There are different size blades, so do make sure that you have everything that you need to have with that glide scope or whatever piece of equipment you're using. And then you do want to make sure and turn it on and ensure that everything's working prior to the situation in which you may need it, because the last thing you want is to need it, go ahead and turn it on, and it's not actually working. All right, the next piece of equipment is going to be obviously our endotracheal tube. So this is something that's often going to be prepared by the respiratory therapist, but we do want to make sure that we do have a couple sizes that are readily available. We are going to need some lube for the tube for when it's inserted, as well as a 10 ml syringe in order to inflate that balloon on the end of it. And we do want to actually ensure that that balloon does inflate and that it holds air properly. And then after you do that, you want to make sure that you fully deflate that prior to insertion. And then also make sure that you, you have whatever you're going to use to secure that ET tube to the patient, uh, as well as potentially a bite block as well. Next is going to be the stylet. And this is actually a flexible but rigid piece of metal that is used to stiffen up the ET tube during intubation. So these are something that's also sterilized and reused, so make sure and keep this after you're done with the intubation. So they are going to come up in that separate packaging after being sterilized, and that's going to need to be inserted into the ET tube prior to the intubation, and then 
then pulled out once the tube is in place. Next thing you're going to need is our end-tidal CO2 detector. Here we typically use a, a small device that I'm going to show here that attaches to the end of the ET tube and then to our bag valve mask, and it actually changes color when CO2 is detected. I'll talk about this more in a minute, but we can use this, or we can also use a continuous end-tidal CO2 monitor, so make sure that if you are going to be using that, that you do have everything that you need for that setup ready to go in the event that that's what you're going to use. So next is going to obviously be our ventilator, and again, this is going to be respiratory that's handling this, but just good to know about that we are going to want to have this vent ready to go. That way, once we're intubated, we have it essentially ready to hook up. So we're going to have initial settings that are going to be put into the vent, and then the vent's going to be on, and then sitting there in standby mode. And then depending on the situation, the vent itself may or may not be in the room during the intubation. Ideally, we would have it in there and ready to hook up immediately, but this isn't always the case, you know, if things are, you're either in a small room or the patient's crashing and just requiring a lot of people being being in there just may not be feasible to have that piece of equipment in the room from the get-go. Next piece of equipment to have around something good is the bougie. And so this I'm going to show here is a, actually a thin kind of semi-rigid silicon tube. You can really kind of think of this as an endotracheal tube introducer. So the bougie can actually easily be passed into the trachea because of its small size and then we can use it as a guide for the endotracheal tube by passing that over the bougie. So essentially you would get the bougie in through the vocal cords and into the trachea and then slide the endotracheal tube along that bougie that's currently in place. And this once again is another piece of equipment that may only be used in cases of difficult intubations but it does sound like that its use in those routine intubations is becoming more and more common as well. Next is going to be the difficult intubation cart. So I'll probably discuss this actually in a future lesson all by itself but if your patient is identified as a difficult intubation you do want to have this cart nearby as if you do need it, you're going to want it quickly. Next, we'll be having some masks with face shields. And this is especially for the person who's going to be intubating, but also for anyone who's really going to be near the head of the bed, you're going to want to have these ready to go. Next is going to be our suction. And you want to make sure that you have your suction set up and all ready to go. You want that suction on high and you want to have the yank hour attached to the tubing. And the reason for this is that we may need this suction to clear out any secretions from the airway to better visualize and place that endotracheal tube, but it may also be needed in the event of emesis to quickly try to prevent aspiration as well as clearing the field of view for the person who's intubating. And then last piece of equipment I'm going to talk about here is going to be our IV pump and really just make sure you have this in the room and that you have plenty of channels or devices in the case if it's a single line per device. So for example, if you're using like the Alaris pump, I really suggest just having four channels attached to it. And so I'm going to discuss more in a minute, but go ahead and prep any meds or fluids you need and have them primed in the pump with the pump programmed and on standby if it's needed. All right, so now let's move on and talk about meds here real quickly. So we have meds that we use for the intubation itself and then meds that we'll most likely need to use afterwards. So here I'm just going to quickly review over the common intubation meds, but also make sure you find out from that provider what it is that they wish to run continuously after the intubation has taken place. So you want to have that prepped, pulled, and ready to go as well. So when it comes to intubation, there's really a, just a couple meds that we typically see with this. The first is actually going to be some sort of sedative medication. So our common choices here are going to be like Atomidate, Propofol, or Versed slash Midazolam. Really the choice of sedative is going to vary from provider to provider, as well as based on whatever the situation is. So for example, in the crashing hypotensive patient, we're probably not going to be choosing propofol here. More commonly these days though, it seems that Atomidate is often used and it really has one of the best hemodynamic profiles and still has a relatively short time of effect. Another medication that you might anticipate needing would be some sort of paralytic. And so here, kind of our common meds here are going to be like Rocuronium, Sux, Nimbex, Vecuronium. Again, these aren't always used, but they are part of our rapid sequence intubation, which is something that I'm going to discuss in a separate lesson here. And then the last thing is really going to be our analgesic. And this could be like fentanyl, morphine, Dilaudid. This really isn't always used, but it may be helpful to help potentiate the sedative that we're giving. So the big thing, the important thing with these meds is to find out what the provider wants to have available. Then get them pulled, drawn up into syringes, and properly labeled. That way you're able to give them quickly when the time comes. 
All right, so now let's talk a little bit more about preparation. So beyond just grabbing and prepping the various pieces of equipment and the medications that are gonna be needed, there are a few other things for you to keep in mind. So first we have our room prep, and for this we wanna clear out any unnecessary clutter that's in the room, and then make sure that there's plenty of room in that room for everyone to be in there. It's also gonna be helpful to have some sort of bedside table for the respiratory therapist to have everything on that they need and ready to grab when it's needed. Go ahead and turn on the lights in the room as well if, if they were currently off. Next is going to be IV access. And this is something that really should happen early, but you need to ensure that you have good IV access. If an IV is bad or an open line is just not available because it has something going through there that just can't be stopped, you're going to need to get a new IV ASAP. Hopefully you've been staying on top of this throughout your shift because the last thing you want is in an emergency, an emergent intubation like this, to not have an IV or something functional that's working for you and having that added stress trying to get that line in place prior to the intubation. Another thing for prep that we can't always do, but is, is definitely important if we can, is going to be to aspirate the stomach. So like I said, this isn't always possible, but if your patient does have an NG tube in place, then go ahead and put that suction on continuous and increase the suction. And we really want to try to empty their stomach out as much as possible with the goal of trying to prevent any potential aspiration. And then from there, we want to take a look at our bed position. So first off, we're going to need to pull that bed away from the wall at the head of the bed. So this is going to give room for that person in intubating to be able to get behind the bed. If there is one of the removable headboards on there, go ahead and take that off as well to help facilitate that intubation. When the time does come to intubate, or if you need to use the bag valve mask, the patient is going to need to be lying flat. That said though, for those in respiratory distress, this may not be possible until we've given them the sedative medication. These people are often needing to sit up high fallers, they're just not going to tolerate lying down, and so that sedative medication is going to need to be given in order for us to lay them flat and have them remain calm while we're doing that. The bed is also going to need to be raised up to a comfortable, natural position for the person intubating. So this is obviously going to vary based on the person who's doing the intubating. The bed is going to need to be raised quite a bit regardless, so we can go ahead and start getting that elevated. And then we can just make those final adjustments once they're lying flat and we have the person at the head of the bed, whatever they deem comfortable for them. Now from here in preparation, we are going to want to pre-oxygenate the patient. So when we're ventilating the patient here with the back valve mask, do keep in mind your BLS stuff. So we've got that head tilt chin lift to ensure that we have a good open airway. Although remember, this isn't going to apply to patients that do have some sort of limitations or injuries that exclude us doing this to their neck. And we really want to try to max out our patient's vital capacity and the reserve as best we can. So we're going to be delivering 100% FiO2 through this bag valve mask, and we're probably going to be slightly hyperventilating them a little bit too. And the reason for this is that when this intubation attempt is taking place, Place, the patient's going to be receiving no oxygenation and no ventilation. So really, if we can fill up their reserve, then this is going to buy us more time for that successful intubation. Hopefully that makes sense. So some patients, though, are just not going to have much reserve regardless, and we may already be bagging this patient just to try to keep them from coding. So in these cases, we can only do the best that we can do. And this is then going to require that quick, successful intubation, and ultimately this is going to make that event more stressful. Then from here, we want to pre-medicate our patient. So we often give the sedative or the analgesic before we even begin using that bag valve mask, except in those emergent cases where we're going to be using that bag valve mask immediately anyways. In these emergent cases too, we may also just be pushing these meds all at once to be able to intubate the patient as quickly as possible. The biggest thing to remember, especially when we have multiple meds that we're giving, including a paralytic, is that you want to give that paralytic last. We want to ensure that sedation is on board before we paralyze somebody. So typically what we do is when we give the sedation, we want to wait for a minute or so before we actually give the paralytic. One good thing to know though is that most of the medications that we use in intubation are actually compatible together in the IV. Therefore, they often don't require flushing between each one. So what I really suggest for you guys to do is to run all these different medications that you commonly use for your intubation through one of those IV compatibility programs such as micro 
Medics or whatever it is that you use and then check this and ensure that this is the case for the meds that you see. And then finally, the catch-all last thing for our preparation is really going to be for our emergency prep. So I already mentioned about having the code cart in the room and getting those defib pads placed on the patient and kind of having them hooked up to the defibrillator there. Um, but there are a couple other things that can kind of help us in the event of an emergency. And the first is going to actually be having a fluid bolus ready to go. And so having a liter of fluid is going to be something that's important to have ready. It's not uncommon, especially with certain medications that we give them for the intubation, combined with the positive pressure ventilation and that rising intrathoracic pressure, that your patient may become hypotensive. You want to have this fluid spiked and attached to the patient, and I really just suggest free hanging this, not running it through the pump, and then having it in a pressure bag too, so that way you could quickly inflate it to push that fluid in quicker if you needed to, in the event that we are going to need to give it quickly. This way, everything is ready to go, and if we notice any hypotension, oftentimes the provider will want these fluids flowing to see if that's going to be enough to resolve this issue. Many times, just giving them some fluid alone will be enough to correct some of that mild hypotension. Now, in the event the fluid is not sufficient uh, or the patient becomes profoundly hypotensive, you're also going to want to have some sort of vasopressor on standby. Now, norepinephrine or levofed is a common one to use, but this really could be situational. Do let your provider know, though, if you have one on standby, let them know what you have and that it's available if needed. Now, typically, in most cases, I'm not going to have this spiked and attached, but I do want to have it nearby to quickly prep and attach to the patient. That said, for the crashing patient who's looking tenuous or already borderline hemodynamically unstable, I would have this ready to go, spiked, primed, and attached to the patient. In some cases, anticipating some hypotension, that provider may elect to start those fluids or even have a low-dose presser prior to innovating. All right, so we went over a lot of preparatory stuff, but let's actually talk about the intubation itself. So as the nurse, your primary job is going to be to, one, push the medications, but two, and probably more importantly, is going to be to monitor that patient during the intubation. Now, respiratory is going to be at the head of the bed, assisting with the bag valve mask at first, and then really having that equipment ready and available for the person who's intubating. And it is helpful at the very least to have one one other person as a second set of hands if they're needed or to be a runner for anything else that may be needed as well. Definitely in more emergent cases, we're often going to have a second respiratory therapist and really a third or fourth person there to help out as needed. So when it comes to the intubation, really who is it who does the intubation? And this definitely varies from place to place and situation to situation. So obviously doctors can and often are the ones who are doing the intubation. So this is going to especially be true for our difficult intubations. And really depending on the situation, anesthesia may also be called for the intubation as they really have the most experience with intubation and airways and especially difficult airways. Now, advanced practitioners such as our PAs, NPs, CRNAs, they can also do this as well. And then in some hospitals, for many intubations, the respiratory therapist can also do this. There definitely are certain situations in which a provider, a physician, or an advanced practitioner would have to be there. But if it's a more straightforward intubation, uh, in a lot of these cases, the respiratory therapist can be the one to do it. And then something in a hospital that I personally haven't seen, but I've definitely heard of, and especially in like our transport and flight cases, the RN can actually do the intubation as well. Now, additionally, out of hospital, we do have our EMTs and our paramedics who do intubations. I do know that some EDs do utilize them in their department sometimes. So perhaps this may be something that they're able to do there, but I'm just honestly truly not sure about that. So while the intubation and everything is going on, like I said, you're really going to be focused on monitoring the patient and the monitor. So during the whole intubation, you're really going to want to be watching the monitor and your patient's vitals there. And you're really going to need to call out these vitals, especially as things are changing and or deteriorating, and make sure that you're loud and make sure that they hear you. You obviously don't have to yell it so that you know people three doors down can hear you, but definitely don't be soft-spoken when you're calling this information. Out. Now, while the intubation is happening, and this may be a very quick thing, or this could potentially drag on for a little bit depending on how much difficulty the person's having, but during this whole time that they're being intubated, remember that patient is going to be without oxygen. So, watching their SpO2 is really going to be important here. So, the 
person who's doing the intubation and, and even the respiratory therapist may be busy with what they're doing in that moment and not able to watch that monitor and closely follow or track where this patient's SpO2 is. So you want to be making callouts of the SATs periodically so that they know where they are and really if it's still okay to continue with their attempt. And remember that this goes for even if those SATs are staying relatively stable, especially true if they're beginning to fall and especially if they're beginning to drop quickly. You're going to want to continue to periodically make these callouts so that everybody is aware of where we're at with the SATs. Now the ECG is probably going to be our next big important thing for us to keep an eye on. If they're beginning to become hypotensive, we could see some compensation in the form of tachycardia. Now if their SATs are dropping or due to some vagal stimulation from having the endotracheal tube in there or pressure on their neck, we could see their heart rate drop and then become bradycardic. As well as the hypoxemia could also lead to bradycardia as well as different arrhythmias. So we really want to keep an eye out for if they're having any new or increased ectopy and then especially for any lethal arrhythmias that may come about. So hopefully if this is the case, you've already got those pads on and ready to go if this does happen. Now, many of our patients are going to have arterial lines with that continuous blood pressure monitoring. But if we do just have the cuff, then we probably want to have it cycling every one to two minutes during the intubation. We want to be able to catch any of those changes with their blood pressure as quickly as possible. Now, during all of this, there is a good chance that the monitor will be alarming, especially with those yellow alarms. And for those, just go ahead and silence these as they come up, as it's really unnecessary to be dinging, especially if you are sitting there monitoring it and then calling out the stats and the patient's vitals. It really just adds more noise and chaos and stress to a potentially stressful situation already. Now, in these stressful situations, every attempt is going to be being made in order to get that ET tube in place. So definitely don't be afraid to speak up, especially if things are beginning to look bad. If your SATs are dropping and you're in the 70s and the 60s or lower and they're getting brady or having increasing ectopy and arrhythmias, make sure that you speak up. At this point, they're probably going to need to abort that attempt unless they are literally right at that point of getting that tube in place uh, and they're going to need to reattempt it really with the goal of avoiding having to code our patient at this point. All right, so we've gone through all that and we've got a successful intubation. And so once that tube is in place, the balloon, the cuff on the end is going to be inflated to seal off that airway and help secure the tube. Then once we have the balloon inflated, we're going to attach an end tidal CO2 detector and a bag valve mask to the patient. So we're going to want to give them a few good breaths to make up for the lack of oxygenation and ventilation that took place during that intubation attempt. We're also immediately looking for color change on the end tidal CO2 detector. So normally it's purple in color, and then when we have CO2 that's passed through it, it changes to a yellow gold color on expiration. So if we're not seeing any color change after we're releasing that bag valve mask, it's highly likely that the endotracheal tube is actually in the esophagus. And if you remember from my previous lesson that this is a medical emergency and it needs to be immediately removed. The patient is probably going to be continuing to desat during this time as well, so that's going to be another telltale sign. Now from here, simultaneously while we're beginning to ventilate the patient and looking for color change on that entitled CO2 detector, we're also going to want to be auscultating the patient for proper placement. So we want to listen for equal bilateral breath sounds while also seeing equal rise and fall of the chest. One other frequent complication is actually something that we call right main stem intubation. So the first branch of the trachea is actually into both the right and left main stems. The right main stem though particularly is more downward and thus it's actually a really common place that both aspiration as well as deeply inserted ET tubes like to go. So if this happens and the patient is right main stem intubated, the patient will still be getting some oxygenation and ventilation so it's certainly less of an emergency than let's say an esophageal intubation but it still does need to be corrected quickly. And this really simply involves deflating that cuff, pulling the endotracheal tube back a little bit and then reinforcing the balloon. This isn't though always something that's caught with auscultation. Uh, in a lot of cases we will and this is how we're going to pick up on it, but sometimes like especially in larger patients it's difficult to really properly auscultate the breath sounds uh, and view that chest rise. So sometimes it's difficult to really distinguish if we've got some sort of unilateral assessment and sometimes it will slip past there and it won't be until we get that x-ray that we see that we have a right main stem intubation. Now on top of auscultating the breath sounds we do also want to auscultate 
the epigastric area to just to double check and make sure that we aren't in the esophagus. Now we should also see some condensation on the ET tube on expiration. And this is going to be another sign that that ET tube is in the lungs. Now the length that the tube is inserted is going to be noted based on the markings on the side of the tube. And we do want to record this somewhere so we know that the tube hasn't moved. Now the recording of the depth of the insertion should be done at the teeth or gums and not the lips. So our lips can swell and change in size and really the teeth slash gum is really going to be more likely to remain in the same position giving us that better landmark to compare our measurements. And just keep in mind that most tubes are typically going to be inserted anywhere from 22 to 24 centimeters at least in adults this is um, but this can vary based on the patient and their size. Um, women are often going to be intubated at shallower depths as well. And so then at this time we're also going to want to secure that ET tube to the patient. So this can be done with like our cloth tape. We have the special uh, endotracheal tube securing tape or some sort of securement device like the Hollister. And then from there, we also want to have a stat chest x-ray done. And this is going to ensure that we have proper placement of the endotracheal tube. That said, the chest x-ray is also going to be helpful for the provider to assess for any other abnormalities that could be going on with the patient causing some of these respiratory issues that were going on. The proper position for our endotracheal tube is for it to terminate two centimeters above the crina or where we have that first branch of the trachea going to the left and right main stem. So here's an example of a chest x-ray for a patient who is intubated. And here you can see we've got our endotracheal tube going and it's terminating here. And then here we can see our left and right main stems. And this is going to be our carina. And as you can see here, this endotracheal tube is approximately two centimeters above the carina. Now the x-ray is also going to be helpful, like I said, in identifying whether or not the ET tube is inserted too far and into the right main stem. Now this is also not to mean that we can't end up with left main stem intubation because that definitely can happen, but it's certainly much less common than the right main stem. So here's a quick example of a right main stem intubation. So once again, here you can see our endotracheal tube and you can actually tell that it's going over to our left, the patient's right. And if you look over here, you can see the left main stem, which actually goes up above where the end of the ET tube is. And this tells us that that tube is inserted too far and into the right main stem. So remember at this point, the radiologist or the, the physician who looks at it is going to basically give a determination of how far it needs to go back. That balloon's going to get deflated. That endotracheal tube is going to get pulled back so many centimeters. And then we're going to reinflate the balloon and then get another chest x-ray to check the placement. Now, in the cases of unsuccessful intubation, if that intubation really was not successful, then we're going to need to abort that attempt, and we're going to have to resume bag valve masking the patient. So at this point, we're going to need to rebuild the reserve that was used up during that intubation attempt before we can attempt to do it again. And this may take a few minutes or more, and potentially more medication may also be needed for this patient as well. Additional equipment may be requested if it wasn't already used, such as the GlideScope, Boost, uh, potentially reaching out to anesthesia. And so again, it's really helpful if you have all of this already there and you can just quickly have it available for the person who's intubating. If the intubation is unsuccessful and the patient is crashing, coding, uh, then a more extreme measure may be taken such as a, a, a crike. This is pretty rare though, uh, but I probably will plan to discuss this in a future lesson. And I think that covers most of the things that I can think of right now when it comes to our intubation process, the things that we want to prep, the things that we're doing during the intubation, and kind of immediately after some of the things that we're checking. I covered a lot of different information in here, and I certainly may have missed some stuff in there, but I really think I was able to get a lot of the stuff out there and really kind of relay some of that information to you guys so that hopefully you'll have a better understanding of what's happening when you get the heads up, hey, we need to intubate so-and-so, that you know the things that you need to be doing, thinking of, prepping, and getting ready to go, as well as having you ready to go to assist during that process. 
So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release, otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.